in Orlando, you know, you never know who's going to walk through your door. And I had, if you ever heard of Roberto Carlos, I had his nephew for three years. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the Kick It With Katie podcast. Hey team, it's Katie here, and today I have Kyle Wilson with me. And Kyle, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to the listeners and let us little let us know a little bit about yourself. Absolutely. So my name is Kyle Wilson. Um, I've also been called the angry soccer guy, Kyle C. Wilson, Kyle C. Uh, Wilson official. That's my Instagram and YouTube channel. Um, so just to kind of summarize so people have an idea, I've was born and raised in uh, the United States. I'm from Alexandria, Virginia, which is right outside DC, so Northern Virginia. And um, I played all levels of youth soccer from the lowest to the top, so recreational to competitive. Um, and the highest level of the time of my youth career was the Dillman Academy, so I played in the DA and did that for two years. Um, ended up playing college soccer at St. Leo University, which is a Division II. And uh, two periods of my youth career, I went on trial with a club in Brazil called Prometas when I was. 13 years old. I think I just turned 13 or maybe just before so I might have still been 12 and then at 14 I went to France and trained with the Olympic Lyonnais Academy um, which is one of the best in the world for youth development so I was there as well um, played division two college at St. Louis University played three years I still have one year of eligibility left due to injury um, after I graduated with a bachelor's degree in sports management I went to Europe to play um, semi-professional division four in France and I uh, was there for about six months, ended up getting hurt. Um, and they covered uh, basically all of my living expenses, got a, you know, you could call it a salary, but a very small salary. So that was a very unique experience looking back on it. Um, and then ended up getting the opportunity. I, well, I actually started coaching first, and then I ended up getting the opportunity to represent the United States men's national futsal team in the AMF competition for the Futsal World Cup um, in 2019. So we had qualifiers in 2018 in Mexico City, and then we got... Uh, it's actually a kind of a funny story, but we didn't qualify, but we got pulled in like maybe 72 hours before the tournament, mm -hmm. which is in Argentina. So we all had to fly down last minute to get there. We actually arrived the day of the first game against Nepal. Um, so we played Nepal, beat them. Then we played, we played, uh, Spain, lost to them. And then we played France, um, and lost to them, which was a really close game. But, um, that kind of summarizes my playing career as quickly as I possibly could and still providing detail. Um, and now I'm, you know, training, coaching, content creation, entrepreneur, whatever word you want to use to describe it at this point. Um, I kind of do everything in between. And uh, my, my goals right now are really just to try and help parents make better decisions because uh, my parents were in, you know, shoes like many other people. They were not sports people. They were not athletic. And, um, you know, we actually did the math. The math was just for me alone, and I have a brother as well, but we spent just for me $82,593 for me to play youth soccer basically from seven years old to 18. Um, and that does not really include travel outside of the country. That's just within the country. So the whole mm -hmm. point of this is where I'm going with it is, you know, parents should try and look at educating themselves to make better decisions. So you're not just wasting money. Like I was fortunate enough to have a coach that cared about development and cared about doing the right thing. And fortunately my parents cared about doing the right thing as well. So it worked out in the end. Um, and so I'm here today trying to do the same thing for other parents. Mm -hmm. And, and when you say uh, parents, are need to be focusing on development yep. as a coach myself and I see players developing and I hear a parent say my player isn't developing the way I think they should what is something that parents should be looking at in their own player because maybe they're too close to it and they can't you know like if if somebody watches a team in like July and then they come back four or five months later and that way they can see the difference. Mm -hmm. But as a person that is literally watching like a hawk, everything that their team does, maybe they don't see the development because they're always there. So what's something that you can tell parents that they need to be looking out for in their player to make sure that they are actually developing and maybe it's something that they're not seeing? Mm -hmm. Well, I would always ask the question first of like, what, what are your expectations? Um, and it's actually interesting because I made a post on Instagram, I think three days ago. And I just asked parents like, Hey, what would you expect the first thing, like the first five things your child should learn when it comes to 
moving into competitive um and i was actually reading all the comments there was like 100 comments or whatever and they were all all over the place like everywhere so i think every parent will have a different set of expectations mm -hmm. um if you're going to ask me that question in terms of like what would i want to see happen mm -hmm. if i had a young kid it's going to depend on their age right um, but I, i've broken it down into this sense of there are five things that a player needs to learn from a technical standpoint um, and it's it's summarized to make it easy and convenient for parents. But the first one is core skill, which is basically just basic manipulation of the ball. Um, so I call that what you would say ball mastery or what I call master the ball. That includes juggling. The second step would be dribbling. The third step would be 1v1 play. So that's now once you learn those two first steps, you now are focusing on 1v1 against an opponent. The third, the, sorry, the fourth step would be passing and the fifth step would be receiving. And then once you have those down to a T, you have the, what is called the foundation, in my opinion, then you can teach a lot of stuff. Now, I've also heard parents, you know, provide the argument of, well, I don't see my son progressing. And that's why I asked the question, like, what are the expectations that you're looking for? Mm -hmm. Because, and Katie, you would know this just as well as me, like development is a rocky road. You're going to have ups, mm -hmm. you're going to have downs, and you're going to have plateaus. You're going to have everything in between. So the yeah. first piece of advice I would give a parent is make sure you find a coach that you believe wants to do the right thing. So... That doesn't mean, you know, they're, what I mean by that is they're trying to play good possession football as an example. They're trying to teach tactics. They're trying to teach technique, um, technique first over anything, obviously, because if you don't have core skill, dribbling, 1v1 ability, passing and receiving, teaching tactics is basically impossible and it would be unreasonable for you or for me to expect a kid to be able to implement tactics if they don't have the skills necessary to use them. So if they don't have core skill and all those abilities in the five steps, and I wouldn't even touch tactics outside of spread out and close the middle on playing defense. So then it just becomes, what are the expectations? As long as you have found a coach that you believe cares about doing the right thing for the kids, because unfortunately uh, my experience shows me that most coaches, at least in Orlando, and I've been to other places as well, um, just kind of evaluating and looking, the, the, the care for kids is not there and it's money first. And don't get me wrong, everybody needs to make money from this because that's pay to play. Everybody deserves to get paid. But when you put kids at the back burner of why we're even here, which is for kids, um, and you don't do the right thing for them, that's where I have an issue. But once you have found a coach that cares, my advice would be give your child the freedom. Don't be micromanaging every single action and decision that they're doing. That would be the wrong move because nobody's perfect. Like, I'm not perfect. Katie, you're not perfect when it comes mm -hmm. to coaching. Like, we all make mistakes mm -hmm. every single day. And, um, uh, but the only thing that I always say is I will always try to do the right thing from what I believe is correct. So everybody might have a smite, uh, not smite, but a, a small difference in opinion of what that should look like. You might think differently. I might think differently. Um, and that's, you know, part of the business. But once you found somebody who you feel is the right person to help lead your kid, give your child the freedom to work with that person and do not micromanage them. Otherwise you will certainly find things that are issues every single day. Um, and that will only lead to a toxic environment. And I don't recommend that. I, I totally agree. Um, I mean, that's one of the things that when people have asked, what is something that I should look for? Like when I just see on yeah. posts on Facebook from other parents and they're like, how do I find the best coach or whatever? And it, it really depends on what your child needs and what you guys need and what yeah. that coach can provide. And so it's not a one size fits all. Um, there could be a really good coach that is really good for one player, but that personality might not mesh yeah. with another player and it might not be, yeah. you know, their learning style or whatever. So maybe that's not the best fit for them, even though, you know, this coach might be really good and has a great track record. This coach over here <laughs> has an okay track record, but they, you know, yeah. work better with your kid than the other one. So it, it really does depend upon personalities as well. So you just need to make sure that you're finding the right fit for your player and what the player's needs are. Yep. Um, I think w since I coach younger ages for girls mainly and knowing mm -hmm. what you're saying about the players need to have those core skills before they can learn other stuff. And so that's been kind of hard for me as a coach to instill in parents because they see other teams mm -hmm. that are doing things that I feel like are levels above what the age group should be learning. And I'm like, 
I need them to yep. be able to dribble the ball. I don't even want to teach them how to pass the ball because mm-hmm. they can't even dribble it. Because, like you said, if once mm-hmm. you receive the ball, what are you going to do with it? Um, you know, and and so there's certain things that at certain ages that you always have to make sure that you're mastering or leveling up or however you want to look at it before you can learn that next step. And that's really hard for some parents to understand because they think that, well, they should be learning these set plays or whatever and i'm like i i just want them to be able to dribble (laughs) the ball so why don't we work on that Mm -hmm. skill first because and and i tell the players all the time what professional player do you ever watch that doesn't dribble like you're going to use this skill your Mm -hmm. entire soccer career career so you have to master that before you can move on to other things so i totally agree like you know there's certain things that you have to build up to because like you said you have to be able to, in order to understand certain things at a certain level in the game, you have to have those basic skills down and understanding the soccer right. IQ to understand it. And that's something that I've been trying to teach some of my, they're getting older now, I've had them for a couple of years, but trying to teach them soccer IQ and thinking about the game differently than just we pass the ball, we dribble the ball, we kick the ball, you know, like basic yeah. things. I'm like, you have to start thinking the game differently and, and recognizing things on the field. And so it's very interesting to see some of their minds starting to understand the game better because of the fact that they understand those basic skills now and trying to read players' bodies and, and different things. So that's that's definitely something that people need to realize that you can't you know it's like a video game you can't level up without doing the other Mm -hmm. levels you know you have to make sure that you can do that other stuff first it's a building upon building you got to build that solid solid foundation of skills um so for parents who or even players basic things that what are some basic things that they can work on at home i mean you've already mentioned you know juggling ball mastery so Mm-hmm. Is there anything like, I, I don't like to necessarily give my players homework, but I always encourage them to practice with the ball at home. So are there certain things that you would recommend right. players, even at younger ages or older ages, that they work on at home on their own to try and get a better sense of the ball? Sure. Yeah. I mean, there's a couple of things. I mean, I actually wanted to go back uh, to what the point you're making a second ago, but I'll, I'll do that after this. So mm-hmm. Um, the first thing I always tell parents is I call it football, but football always starts at home. Soccer starts at club practice. And, um, if you want to just go play soccer, then you're just going to train the two or three days a week with your club. You're not going to do anything else. And then that's why I say 95% of the country, if not more, or what I would call the average player within our country, which is basically everybody. Um, they just kick it, boot it and send it. So if you want to be different and play football, um, then training starts at home and, if anybody needs free material, uh, I put together, I actually used to sell this, but I decided to give it away for free on my YouTube channel. I have five technical training programs that players can use at home. You just watch the video and repeat the process of what it is. So if you're stuck and you don't know what to do, start with that. A lot will depend on the level of skill of the player. So if, if you have like a recreational player, the first one I would use would be my developing touch series. Um, and that will cover juggling footwork, And I think it's dribbling the third one. And that's all in a series that you can work on. And they're like five or seven minute videos. Um, And then I have more expensive ones too. But the the point is you should always be practicing at home. Um, I always make the recommendation if if you expect the club to provide the training, especially in current climate, it won't happen. They're going to be scrimmaging most of the time, unfortunately. And it won't be to the long-term benefit of the the child So, or or the players. So the key is you have to always train at home um, and you don't need a lot. You can just have a ball. And in fact, most of the stuff I try and produce now, uh, cause I'm not a big fan of cone work. Uh, I never have. And I see people all the time and this isn't a knock on anybody in particular. It's just, you know, speaking out loud for parents to understand. You'll see a lot of people use what I call training that sells. And that's where you put a lot of cones on the floor and you have players do like two cone patterns. Um, so that means like you'll see stuff where they like do pull, push, pull, push, pull, push, and things like that between two cones or three cones or whatever number of cones it is. And those do have value if you have a very low level skilled player, in my opinion, um, just because they don't have the comfortability to move the ball, to connect with the ball, to master the ball, to dominate the ball, whatever word you want to use. So if you have a very low skilled player, they can be effective. But once you get kids that have general ability to use the ball, 
Um, I completely recommend other types of training. And a lot of that would be just basic ball skills with minimal cones, if no cones. So most of the training that I do now, um, in terms of technique, especially when it comes to dribbling, we try to take away all the cones um, and give kids the freedom to experiment and, and try different things. And there's a bunch of elements you can work on without a cone. Um, a cone can add value. So if you want to work on a weave where you go in and out of cones, you can do that as well. I recommend you get pulls um, because that is more of a figure of what a defender is going to look like mm -hmm. than a cone. Um, so people make the argument, well, cone, you can use as a defender. Yeah, you can for sure. But if you can replicate that cone or replace that cone with a person or a pole that is at least closer to what a defender is going to look like, it makes it easier for the player to translate that from training to a game. So that's the recommendation that I always make. And mm -hmm. I just tell parents, be very careful when you go and you see people just doing two cone patterns um, because that's training that sells and it's very lazy coaching in my opinion, because anybody can put two cones down and say, okay, you're now going to pull, push, pull, push and do this 300 times or then do, and then do this next pattern. Um, it takes actual ability to coach a kid on why they need to use certain footwork and when and how do you actually apply that stuff to a game. Um, so that, that's mm -hmm. just my recommendation. Yeah, definitely trying to keep things as much game-like as possible. So that's something mm -hmm. that I usually try and do with my trainings is making sure that, you know, whatever we're practicing is something that can be easily translated and thrown into a game. Like if I took yeah. away... You know, if we're doing something in a grid, it's if I took those cones out, you'd be on a field right now. And this is exactly where it would be. It's just you're trying to stay spread out or whatever the cones are, you know, doing. So that way, when those are lifted, it's easily translated to a game and you're on the field. Mm -hmm. Like if you just take that off, right. you're you're there and you're on the field. Um, so you wanted to go back to something that I was talking about before. Do you remember what it was? I don't um, when I was talking about, I don't, you, you made a comment you were, you were talking about, uh, I honestly forgot at this point. Um, you were talking <laughs> about, oh, tra no. uh, training. I was going to bring up, oh, I was going to bring up this point. I do remember at least a part of it. So there's a reason why I stopped posting a lot of the training content that I used to do. And that's because I have conversations with parents all the time. And I, I think you talked about how parents want to skip steps. They don't want to do the baby steps first. Right. So an example would be over the summer, I got a phone call from a guy, you may know his name, um, Luis Nani. And mm -hmm. he's a professional player, played at the highest level, played in the Champions League, won the Champions League, played for Manchester United for many years. Um, and so he happened to reach out to me because I trained some of his former teammates at Orlando City. And um, I was like, hey, wh what do you want to work on? He goes, fundamentals, technique. I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, so this is Luis Nani, a guy that's played at the highest level, won basically every trophy there is except for a World Cup. And here you are telling me that you want to work on technique. Okay. So if a guy like that, that has a ridiculous level of skill and technique that he, he was able to do stuff where I was sitting there going and my brother as well, we were like, how can you even do this? Like it was just mind blowing some of the stuff that he could do with a ball. And I'm like, man, not like it's so backwards what we're teaching kids here. And um, like an example would be, he would be able to, he, he could make a pass and make sure it was firm, like a hard firm pass back to, to, to me or to my brother who was there working with him as well, um, without even opening his foot all the way or following through. And like one of the things I always teach kids, hey, lock the ankle, follow through. Lock mm -hmm. the ankle, follow through, keep the toe up. And he's able to do that by just basically just like a 40 degree turn of his foot and he's able to smash it back. And I'm going like looking at him like, how are you able to do that? But what, what I gathered from that was his technical level is so high. It's so mm -hmm. good that he can do things that other people can't. Mm -hmm. And um, again, he talked about it, 36 year old, hey, I want to work on my technique. So the other point that I wanted to make with that is, te and the reason why I stopped posting a lot of my training sessions anymore is because when I would, and I do like I was doing a lot of privates and stuff and people would always say like, why don't you do this kind of stuff with the teams and stuff that you run? And I'm like, well, it's a different scenario one, but two, the kids are not at that level yet to implement what you're asking for. So like they want to do volleys, they want to do high control out of the air and, and whatever the circumstances and the players do not have the skill yet. You have to learn how to crawl before you walk. And if I, and if I summarize it this way, I always bring it back to school. So if we take a child and we say, Hey, you know, six year old, for example, maybe younger, but let's just use the point at six. And it would be unreasonable for you or me, Katie, to expect the six year old to be able to read a book, let alone a full page if they can't pronounce words or even the alphabet mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So if they can't, let's start with the alphabet. If they can't pronounce the alphabet A, B, C through to Z, that means they can't form words, which means mm-hmm. they can't read a word, they can't read a phrase. They have to learn all of those baby steps before they can start reading even a word or a phrase or a page or let alone a book. Mm-hmm. So that is the, the same idea behind training. The, the player has to have a, a complete level of technical skill to be able to be taught and achieve anything else because it would be unreasonable for us to expect the player to be able to do that without having the core skills. That was, that's Ex- what I was going to say. I remembered it all now. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's very, like I said before, it's very interesting to see the parents that when a kid is six or seven – and they want their kids to be passing the ball with their teammates around yep. the field. And I'm like, um, hello, can we get them to dribble the ball first? Like be yep. comfortable mm-hmm. with the ball at their feet? Like that's literally all that I want to teach kids at those young ages is just mm-hmm. being comfortable with the ball at their foot. Not necess- like, sure, if they can somehow manage a pass to a teammate, great, but I'm not that is not like when I have run training sessions for just those little kids, it's like I have a ball at their feet the entire time. Everybody Mm -hmm. has a ball and they're doing something with the ball the entire time. And it's the repetition of it, having it at their feet, getting comfortable with it. And it's really interesting that the parents now, especially those of us that played growing up, having that expectation that, because I think back and I'm like, at, when I was that age, was I taught how to d- cross the ball into the box? Like, there's not even a box at that age to cross sure. into. But it's like, yeah. I, I'm like, I don't, I don't understand like where you think that you're. Why I don't understand why you think your player should be up there at a se- at age seven, and why that is is what your expectation is. And you know, there are some players who have extremely good technical skill at a very young age because ever since they've learned how to walk they've had a ball at their feet or something and they are to me the exception and and that is great for that Mm -hmm. player but the majority of players at least the ones that I have dealt with like just getting them to learn how to dribble correctly and have the proper technique is where it needs to start and we don't want to skip that step because it's a fundamental of the game and it's something that they have to have their entire career is a good good ball skill, good ball work. And so that's, that's where I want, where I try and start with it. And so, um, it's very, I mean, I, I basically told people, you know, this is what I'm trying to get them to do is to do this and, and, um, telling them to practice at home on their own, um, because the repetition, and I would hope that you would agree the repetition, I would assume is why, Nani has that amazing skill is because he has that repetition and he's very comfortable with the ball at his foot. And so, you know, after doing it for probably 30 years, he is extremely well good at it. And, and you should not expect your 10 year old to have the same ball control and skill as a 36 year old. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like it's, it's, it's totally different. Completely agree. I mean, it's, it's, if people, if, when I say people, if players aren't practicing at home, they're not going to have the level of skill necessary. Like, so mm-hmm. really two things. And I think people misunderstand the average American seven, eight, and nine-year-old. And what I mean by that is the average seven, eight, nine-year-old, even six, if you want to throw a six-year-old in there, they can understand basically four things, themselves, a teammate, a defender, and a ball. Now, this is a separate point, but we're throwing kids at 7v7 when they can only understand those four things. And I'm talking about the average mm-hmm. player in that age group. So they should not be doing anything other than basically two versus one based on that point that I just made there because they don't have the mental capacity, the average, to mm-hmm. handle anything above that. And it's, it's like I'll go out and just watch games and you'll just see the average kids, which again is about 95% of the country, if not higher, and – it's almost like a bumblebee pit, like trying to get honey and they're all chasing one ball because they all want the ball at their feet. They want the ball. They Mm -hmm. don't understand concepts above two and one. So it it becomes to the point that you made dribbling is the key foundation that children need to learn outside Mm -hmm. of touch, um, which would be dribbling and touch. That's all they should be practicing on repeat over and over again for like four years. So, I mean, anything below six. So even if you're four or five, three, two, whatever, Touching the ball. So, like, one of the first things I learned 
uh, my parents taught me to do when I was a kid at three years old was kick the ball. And my argument is don't teach them to kick it. Teach them to pull it, push it, dribble it. Mm-hmm. Get the word kick or pass out. Because, mm-hmm. again, if you think about the average kid, let's, let's use ice cream. You give a seven, eight, nine-year-old ice cream. Ask them to share it. <laughs> they're not going to share it. They're going to say no. I do this test all the time. Right. We, you know, after games, kids get a snack and I'll say, hey, will you share this? They go, no. Mm-hmm. So if they don't want to share their ice cream or whatever it is, why do you think they want to share the ball? Mm-hmm. They don't want to share the ball. They want the ball at their feet. That's why they, they do this. So let the kids have the ball and play with the ball at their feet. And, and we need to do a better job as a country understanding that we don't have top level kids that are ready to play 77 or 99. And how, how could I know this personally is, at our organization, we have three teams that play 7v7 under 2014. So they're U10. We have one 2014 team that is exceptional. They're very, very good. Very good. They, you know, they are the exception to the rule. But mm-hmm. we have two other teams that are nowhere near close to that. Yet those mm-hmm. parents are asking, why are they not training like that team? And I'm like, well, they're not mm-hmm. at the same level. It's impossible. And I'm like, what you guys are misunderstanding is this group has had three years of training where you've had three months or six months, whatever it is now. Right. So your child has to play catch up in the sense of developing those technical skills, pass, uh, sorry, not passing, dribbling first and touch first. Once they are, have that level, then we can focus on 1v1. And then once they have 1v1 and they're comfortable with those three levels, then we can teach them passing and receiving. But until then, there's just no point to do it. And the, the level of competency they need to have in dribbling to get to a high level is, especially in the modern game right now for men or women, is extremely high. Mm -hmm. And it's really difficult for parents at the younger ages to not compare their player to another player in the age group. And that is, I think, the worst thing that you can do is compare your player to another player Mm -hmm. because every player is different and every player develops skills at different rates. And so you have to give your player time to master that. Like, please do not stress or compare because if your player is aware of it, that you're doing it, that's going to put even more stress on them. And they're not going to want to play because they're not Mm -hmm. living up to whatever your expectation is. And so you really, you really can't Mm -hmm. throw expectations on kids like that. It's, it's really, it's really bad for them mentally and will affect them physically and in their game. Mm -hmm. You can see it. I've seen it as a coach. I've seen it as a parent on the sidelines you know just knowing expectations that people have put on their players and watching their players Mm -hmm. not meet the expectation and you just feel bad for them and you just I mean at that age you want them to love the game they need to learn to love the game and maybe they don't maybe in the end they end up not loving the game and that's fine if it's not what they want to do you know you want to have a player that enjoys the game and it's like you've said, it's about the kids. And, and if the kid isn't enjoying it and you know, I mean, as somebody who loves soccer, obviously we want them to like it, but if they don't love it the way that you want to, don't force it on them either. Like that would be awful as well. But you, you want to give the player the enjoyment, the growth space in order for them to feel comfortable and, and get those skills down as, as a player. Um, so for people, you've already mentioned your YouTube channel, um, you have your podcast as well that I've listened to some stuff on. What are some other, other than like maybe your resources, do you have any other resources or is it stuff that you think up on your own that you grow from? Do you watch other leagues? Do you watch other where does your material come from? Is it just stuff that you've put together on your own or do you have like a, I don't know, a a place where you get it from, like where you see what people are doing in other countries and you kind of mesh it together. So what is your, what is your inspiration for it? There's the word. I'm like, I can't even think of what it's called. There you go. Good question. So this is why I said the most important thing is to find a coach who cares. So when I was a young kid, um, probably about six, my parents found a guy that was, his background is French. Um, so he lived here from France and he cared about doing the right thing. So I would accredit probably 90% of the stuff that I know now from him. Mm-hmm. Um, I still talk to him on a you know consistent basis. We share ideas and do stuff or whatever. But the reason why I'm able to think differently today is because my foundation was different than the average American kid. 
So had I not met him and I grew up in the system the way the system is currently set up, I, I would not be here today. So uh, I'm fortunate enough to have a couple of people in my network, um, like, I guess you could use the word mentor or whatever, like my mentor and, and other people. Like, I have a very, very good relationship. He's almost like a dad to me. He's the current technical director of the Olympic Leone Academy. Um, he's on the girls' side right now. Um, he's mm -hmm. been in the academy for, like, 22 years. Mm -hmm. So me and him are constantly in conversation about new ideas and things that are happening around the world and thought process and stuff. But the, the key thing is you have to – that's why I said at the beginning – you have to find somebody that wants to do the right thing um, because that's where your child will learn the most. And um, I'll, I'll even share one of my secret weapons. Um, I, I used not to share it, but I do now. It's called the Creation Football Federation Development Curriculum. I've read the book three times and I'm reading it now for a fourth time. It is the best book I have ever read. And I feel like it's like my brain on steroids um, in terms of the youth development process. Like they layer out everything that they do as a country, um, which you, I think you can buy the book on Amazon right now for like 50 bucks. Mm -hmm. um, that book is worth millions of dollars, easily worth millions of dollars. The guy that wrote it, his name is Romeo Jozak. Um, he was the technical director of, of the Croatian Football Federation for a numerous amount of years. And, um, you know, they know how to develop players. And I always ask the question, like, how can a country like Croatia that has three to four million people in the last, let's say, five years get to a World Cup final produce a Ballon d'Or winner in Luka Modric, uh, go to a World Cup semifinal in 2022, and then reach a Nations League final in 2023. And that's because their youth development system is so good that it's about the kids. Now, obviously, there is, you know, the kids have to be developed. If they're not developed, they're going to get released. But they have, a, they have a plethora of talent, and they're focused on developing players. And so, like, a lot of my recent content has been thrown towards, you know, can we expect as a country, the United States – for the U.S. men's or U.S. women's national team to be successful again in the long run, a.k.a. winning a World Cup, mm -hmm. when our youth development structure is, you know, without swearing on, on camera, a complete and utter disaster. Mm -hmm. Because development with like 99% of places is not the priority. It's just getting dollar bills in, mm -hmm. what I call the cash cow. And, and I always argue like, look, everybody, because of the system that we have of pay to play, can make money. It's okay to make money. But you mm -hmm. cannot forget about the reasons why we're doing this. And the reasons why we're doing this is to either provide kids an opportunity to play, one, or two, they have a goal of wanting to get somewhere. So they want to go to college and be a Division One college athlete or whatever it is, or they want to be a professional. So we have to do our jobs and help people make better decisions. And, and that's why, like, I used to sell the content, um, which is now on my YouTube channel for free. But then I made the decision, like, if I want to be a guy that helps change the kind of landscape and help parents make better decisions, because the problem at the end of the day is organizations know that parents don't know. So uh, mm -hmm. I have a very good friend of mine. He works for one of the biggest organizations on the East coast. They have like 13,000 kids and they have staff meetings every single week. And their conversations are again, I'm paraphrasing this, but they're never about what the kids need to work on or what they want to do developmentally. It's, these age groups are behind in revenue. These age groups are above in revenue. How can we get more kids? How can we buy more clubs? It's it's never about why we're even here in the first place. It's just dollar bills. So when you have situations like that happening, it would be unreasonable for anybody to expect that the United States could then win a World Cup because our system is not designed to produce players. It's designed to just make money. So that's mm -hmm. where people like you and me come in to try and help educate people and to try and show people that there is a different path to take versus just playing for an organization because they tell you they're the best place to play. If they were really the best place to play, don't you think they would provide you the resources that I provided for free? And I'm one guy. And I spent mm -hmm. over a thousand hours putting all these resources together and I'm giving it away for free because I mm -hmm. felt it, I wanted to make a bigger impact and help parents make better decisions so you don't just spend $100,000 because that's what parents are going to spay these that is what parents are going to spend in 2023, 2024 season, if not more you know, throughout time. They're going to spend at least $100,000 or more on their child's youth career based on all the travel and all the play and the hotels and the three-hour round trips for one game. It's, it's going to be ridiculous. So if you're going to know or if you know that you're going to spend that much money, wouldn't you want to make sure that your investment is in the right way? Mm -hmm. So my question becomes, if these other organizations, the clubs that your child plays for, really cared about your kid, wouldn't they provide you resources like I have 
and said, hey, you're going to want to learn these things. My argument is no, because then if you're educated, they make less money. So there, there's a lot of stuff to kind of unpack there, but I felt I had, I had to say that. Yeah, it's really, I mean, just thinking about my own market here in Utah in the last few years, the things that have been going on that have made coaches who actually care absolutely irate um, and the things that have, you know, happened and the players that are getting swindled, um, basically, and, you know, they're leaving the coaches that care. I know that there are several coaches in my state specifically, because I'm just talking about things that I know, um, that do care and they've, you know, been doing it for years and it's always been about the kids and their development and trying to change lives. That is the reason right. why, you know, some of these kids coaches do it is so that they can change lives. But with the recent landscape change, it's made their jobs that much harder because there's all these other things that have come up and it's made it so difficult for them to compete with what they've been providing, which sucks because I know that there are good coaches who are trying to do the right thing by their players. And then there's other people who are car salesmen and unfortunately aren't there Mm -hmm. for the kids. And so it's really hard to see because there's not a lot that we can do ourselves to, to fix it or change people's minds about things. And it's really sad to see what, what's been happening um, without going into too much detail, but it, it does suck um, to see mm-hmm. the way the landscape has changed and how people who, you know, our, our club that we coach for has like a minimum requirement of what a coach is supposed to do. And there's plenty of coaches who go above and beyond that. They don't get paid extra to do anything above what they're already doing because they want to provide that extra, you know, they want to be there for the kids. Otherwise they wouldn't do it. You know, if, you know, this is time away from our families, our own kids and, and, You know, we're not getting paid extra to do the two, three extra trainings a week for your kids. You know, we're getting paid the same as somebody who only does it twice a week. And but we want to be there for the kids and we want to be able to provide that. And it just sucks that, you know, the landscape has changed so much so that the people who want to gobble up all these other clubs, like you said, um, I've seen another Mm. club in our state doing that exact same thing. And it's, it's been absolutely Mm. maddening that people still go play there. Cause I'm like, they have like 10 teams in that age group. Like, what are you expecting to get out of that? Like, I I don't know. You're not going to be on the top team. (laughs) So I don't, I don't know. It's, it's just a name notoriety, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, again, I think it comes down to parent education. So mm-hmm. because parents are un- uneducated in the process of development and what it takes to get to a higher level, they're going to continuously make mistakes where they're just throwing money away. Like I literally had a conversation yesterday with a parent and she was like, I wish I met you, Kyle, five years ago. And I was like, well, why is that? And she's like, because my older son, who's now in college, could have really used your help. She's like, we spent, I think the number she gave me was just around 3K a month for her kid to play. Um, Because he was doing a whole bunch of stuff like uh, soccer school, like in the morning and club and private training. And she's like, look where he's at today. And I was like, where is he? She's like, he doesn't even play anymore. He wants to play, but he doesn't play anymore. And I said, well, Mm -hmm. that's because probably they just took your money and they didn't really care. And um, again, I'll, I'll make the same argument. Everybody can make money from this, but do the right thing for the kids and for the people. And Mm -hmm. if you're not willing to do that and you just want to make money, then Parents need to educate themselves so they don't keep making the same mistakes over and over and over and over again. Because otherwise, you're just throwing money at a wall and you'll lose your money because the investment, like, I hate to call it an investment, but you're, it's like an education. You're investing in your mm-hmm. child's, you got two paths. You got the soccer education, which is what we have here in this country, unfortunately, or you teach them actual football. So you either go left or you go right. And either way, you mm-hmm. got to invest money. Which way are you going to go? Are you going to go left where you're just learning to kick it, boot it, and send it method? Or are you going to go right where your child actually will learn how to play football? They're going to learn skills. They're going to learn ability. They're probably going to lose a lot because if they're Mm -hmm. trying to do the right thing and everybody else is doing the wrong thing and they're just kicking the ball and you'll hear coaches and parents scream, you know, kick it, boot it, send it, or whatever other word or phrase you want to use to describe it is fine. But 
that's not how you play the game. If you go to any country around the world that is actually accredited in football development um, and have won World Cups, you don't see kids just the entire time booting the ball. They might kick it out once, but they're actually mm-hmm. trying to play football. They're not playing American soccer. So that's the argument that I always make. And if when it comes away from the kids at the end of the day, then it, it just becomes a bigger problem. Yeah, I had a a game in the fall with one of my teams and we've been um, struggling to get goals in. We are great at possession, keeping the right. ball, but scoring goals hasn't been, we're still trying to, f- anyway, so trying to find players that want to get the ball in the net has been really difficult, but our soccer on the field, the football The passing, the possession um, has been great. And, but again, we either tied or lost most of our games in the fall, which really sucked. And and especially as a coach, because I'm like, I know that we're playing good soccer. It's just, we're missing that element. And, you know, I, I know that that's what we're missing. And anyway, I had a coach come up to me after one of the games that they had beat us. And he just said, just so you know, you're doing a really good job with your team and what you're teaching your players. He's like, I can see it. And you're doing great. He's like, you played better football on the field than my own team did. He's like, all we do is kick the ball up the field. And, you know, he's like, you guys play better soccer. And so I was very impressed that another coach who just beat my team came over and acknowledged that my players are trying to do the right thing in the game. And so Mm -hmm. I made sure that my players knew that because it was, you know, it's really hard when you know that you're trying to teach the kids the right thing. And like you said, you're not going to win all the time. And it's really hard for parents to understand that because they're, a lot of them are just like, my team needs to be winning. In order for my player to go anywhere, they have to be on a team that's winning, which again, you know, sometimes that is true for certain things, but at there's not a college scout at a U11 game coming to see how well your team is doing. That The development is going to show up later when they're actually being scouted when they're older. And so again, it's the fundamentals. And so it, it was really, it's really hard to, tell the parents, you know, trust the process. And I do have a good core group of parents who are like, we understand the process. We're here for it. We know. And so that's one of the things that I've been really happy with is that the parents that know that this is the process and, you know, they know that this is what they want. And so it's been great to see that they're okay with seeing the little bit of struggle because they know that their kids are being taught the right way to play soccer and or football. And, you know, so for me, who's somebody that's like, I, I want to do right by the girls, but I don't just want to, I'm like, I could teach them just to boot the ball down the field and go shoot the ball as hard as they can in the goal. And maybe, I don't know if that would have an effect on the way that we played because we play better in possession. They're very good technical players. And, and so it's really hard for parents to see, you know, a team that's literally just, well, why can't we just kick the ball down the field? And I'm like, because that's not soccer. Like, that's not how you play football. Do you watch professional teams and that's all they do is just launch the ball down the field? Not usually. And so I, it's really difficult for for me in my position because I want to, like you said, I want to and am teaching them the right way. And it's really hard for parents to grasp that concept that this is the way that they need to be taught how to play the game um, in order for them to be successful in the long run. You know, the short term, again, like there's no trophy at the end of the season, but there will be payoffs in the long run if your player knows how to play well and, eventually a college coach is going to need to be able to see a player that is good technically and all that stuff. And if all they're being taught is how to kick the ball as hard as they can down the field, your player that actually knows how to own the ball versus somebody that can just boot it, you know, there's a big difference there. So it's, it's definitely, it's really difficult for coaches who want to do the right thing and are trying to do the right thing versus the people who are just going after wins. And it's like, I don't want to teach them how to just, do that because that's not soccer that's not the way to play (laughs) anyway that's my rant (laughs) this to your point i'll add this to your point so basically a year ago in march in april um seven of my players that were 07 and 06 uh played against we were invited to join a international group to play against a bunch of colleges but one of them was ucf 
And I would love to get your insight on this. Um, and basically where I'm going with this is the entire starting 11 of UCF was international. Every single player. Starting 11 international on the men's side. I don't know about women's, but the men's side was international. Their starting goalkeeper is from Catefe, Spain. He played on the Catefe uh, Academy, went through the entire program, um, and he even got to the B squad. So the Catefe B squad, which is just under the La Liga team, so the first team. Mm -hmm. And that guy was unbelievable. I think the only reason why he did not make it as a pro based on what I saw was because he didn't meet, he didn't pass the eye test. The eye test mm -hmm. is, in my opinion, for a goalkeeper is, you know, 6'3", 6 6'4", 6 6 this guy is like 5'11", 6 foot. Mm -hmm. So that, that's hard for a goalkeeper. But the, the point that I'm going with this is, how do we expect American kids that don't have the level to begin with, even if they're playing in a league that, you know, pro promotes exposure, you know, playing in MLS next or ECNL or GA or all these leagues, which are great. Cool. I, I like the idea behind it. But how can we expect a kid that goes from that level? Let's use MLS next. because I'm talking about boys. So it goes from MLS next playing only his age group to come in and go to UCF and compete with a guy that is 20 years old. I think he was 20, maybe 21 and um, played on the B squad of Katefe. Mm -hmm. from my perspective, it would be intrinsically impossible for a 18 year old. That's only ever played his age group, even though it was MLS next cool, fine MLS next, mm -hmm. but to go against a guy that has that level of experience that was on basically the verge of playing for the first team, it would be completely unreasonable to expect that this kid could ever compete with him. So then the challenge becomes how do we get kids or players closer to that type of level? And the only mm -hmm. way that I've found to do that is to put them against adults if they're not in, in if they are not in an MLS academy, which is only on the boys' side right now. So mm -hmm. if you're not in an MLS academy, the only way to even create a comparable level of performance or play or experience would be to have them play adult. Um, and and I just haven't found another way around that. And there's no closer gap in my opinion. Or there's no way to close the gap any other way that I have found other than playing against grown men. So I don't know if there's anything yeah. you you thought about that, but it's it's very hard to expect that to happen. It's it's really um interesting that you bring that up. So um my husband coached uh well he still coaches um an 06 age group and last year he um he had about 5 players that were 07s and they were they were playing up, you know, but they were top 07 players and at tryouts this year even though their team won the national championship that they were currently on, they went and all wanted to go play for their own age group because they thought it was going to be better or whatever for scouting, I guess, um, recruiting for colleges, I, I, I assume, because, you know, they wanted to be in their own age group. And I don't know if it's because they wanted to stand out mm -hmm. or what. And also because of the age change, you know, half their team was going to be possibly graduating and then they were going to kind of be the leftovers if they stayed. And so that's how it, that's also been the difficult thing since they did the age change a few years ago, um, you know, where some kids graduate and some kids don't. Um, and it, those players were playing at such a high level against older players for such a, for such a consistent long period of time that for me, for them to go backwards was like just mind-boggling I was I was kind of like I don't understand did you really think about this decision <laughs> and some of them I don't know if they did well, parents. I don't, I, it parents. yeah well and and I'm sure it was like I don't know that the kids really wanted to leave I have no idea I don't I didn't have any discussions I don't know this is just me from an outsider looking at it and going I, ca I can't believe that you would leave that you would leave after everything that your team has accomplished and go play for you know, maybe a team that definitely hasn't accomplished what they have. And I don't know what their coach is providing or selling. I have no idea. And it it was really disheartening mm -hmm. because I'm like, I don't know that you're going to be staying at that same level that you were at. You know, one of the players did go and he was training with um, a local U UPL team. UPSL? 
yes. I'm like, that's not right. Um, I'm like, I'm missing a letter. Um, they were playing, training with a lot. So they were training with men. But the problem is, is that the guys that he was training with are like also former players um, that are like playing collegiate or maybe they're just playing on weekends. Like they're not consistently training every day. So it's like somebody's workout on the weekend. So yeah. you're not playing against high level players. Yes, you're playing against men, which obviously like I've watched some college games that some of our former players have played in in the last year. And it's really interesting to see like the physicality change going from youth soccer to men's soccer, you know, in, in, in college. And so the physicality of it is some of it is different. And it, it was just disheartening for me, like I said, where I thought these players were getting better exposure. They were getting better level of play because they were playing up. And that is something like at the younger ages within my club that I coach for, if a player is excelling at their own age group, getting them to train up because it's going to give them that extra push and they're going to learn how to play bigger, you know, and, and there are other clubs in our area who lock you into your age group. Like, it doesn't matter if you are the most amazing player in your age group, you're playing for that age group only, and you're playing for this team only. It right. doesn't matter how well you're doing. And it really sucks because it's like, if it's about the player and they need to be pushed more, you need to be able to get them to that next level. You know, you shouldn't be locking a player in to that, you know. And so that's, I mean, even if I have a player that's struggling, I'm like, you can come train down, you know, practice down with my other players just so you can get more training on the ball. And having that flexibility of being able to train with older players or, you know, so that you can get that extra physicality. Or I know you've mentioned like for girls, um, we tried to get one of our really good girl players to go train with a boys team. And that would have been, I think that would have taken her game to the next level if she would have stuck with it. She didn't want to stick with it. I think she was a little embarrassed because she was the only one there. I tried to get my daughter to go with her, but my daughter wasn't at the same level as her. And um, so she stopped doing it. But I'm like, if she, I think if she had stuck with it, it would have made her an even more exceptional player than she already is. Um, But I know that you did a post recently. I don't know if it was today or yesterday, but it was in the last little bit about, you know, having girls train with boys. I had a player on here previously, Ellie Walbrook, and she would go train with boys all the time, you know, for that physicality. She trained with her brother, um, like just to get that physicality going and playing with boys is um, something that can definitely elevate a girl's game if if people, I mean, I've thought about doing that with one of my girls teams because they've, they're really good technically, but physically sometimes they just get pushed off the ball. And I'm like, I guess we got to go play boys so that they can get that toughness in them. (laughs) Right. Yeah. I I always make the argument for girls. In fact, I made, which you may or may not have seen before. I made an entire thing for boys and girls, one for boys, one for girls. It took a long time to put together, but I call it the, uh, the youth soccer playbook. Um, in, in the girls edition, what I did was it's basically from birth to signing division one college or signing college and prof- or, or professional. It's, it's, you know, a roadmap mm-hmm. basically to get from birth all the way through. And anyways, the entire time that they're in their youth career, probably up to like 13 or 14, I'm like, play with boys, play with boys, play with boys. Um, and, and the reason why I said that is because one of the girls that I worked with, she played top division one. She played basically every level of, of college, but she played top division one for two years. And she was just banging in goals left and right. And every time that I would work with her, she would always come back and say, I want to play with boys. I want to play with boys. I want to play with boys. And um, I worked with her for about four and a half years, um, from like 14 until her second year of college. And it it just becomes like she was, I don't want to say she played like a guy, because that's not accurate to say, but she was the most aggressive, the most physical uh, powerful. She was not afraid to make contact. She was hitting people left and right. So it was almost like playing like a guy without mm-hmm. using that, if that makes sense. But she played like that because she just played years of playing with boys. Whereas you're not really going to get the same physical level of performance or play when you play with girls. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, it's just not the way that girls play and that's right. okay. It's just the way that girls are. And there's no problem with that. But if if girls have the goal of wanting to go on and, and continue their career above and beyond, I always make the recommendation, play with boys as long as you can, because um, it will only you know toughen you up and, and help you understand the physical side of the game and, and truly help you, if you can mentally push through it, take you to the next level. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, it's definitely something that I've, like, I have a player that I coach right now who played with boys until um, she came to play over for our our girl side, but she played with her twin brother um, for many years, and you can tell, like, she is scrappy, and she is not afraid, and, and she's one of those on the smaller side, right. and she will go up against girls that are a foot taller than her, and she doesn't back down, and I'm like, I want everybody to play like her because she isn't afraid and she's, you know, she's scrappy and she's not afraid to use her body. And even though she's the smallest on the field, she plays so big. Um, And and so she's like, I I totally see it with her that it it has made a huge difference for her and her game because she played with those boys. And it's Mm -hmm. it's amazing to see, you know, what what she can do with the ball and and keep the ball and things like that and how she fights for it. Um, So I totally agree with that. Mm -hmm. Just for fun for people, um, just go in a time capsule and and just I want to share. So you played because this is something that is is a very rare experience. I, your football or your futsal national team run. Can you just highlight some things for people um, that maybe are listening that kind of want to know a little bit more um, about your experience. So it was a very last minute pull in that you guys went and played down in Argentina. It was, Mm -hmm. Um, can you just, what Mm -hmm. was the, what was the experience like for you as far as like the, the draw of the people, the atmosphere? Um, I mean, what was that level for you? I mean, it wasn't, Obviously, it wasn't like U.S. men's national team outdoor, but even the futsal team, I mean, that's that's an amazing accomplishment. I, I love futsal. I think it's a great tool for people to work on ball skill. Um, but what what are what are some highlights or memories from that specifically that you want to share with some of the listeners just so that they can kind of get a glimpse of what an event like that could be like for for people? Sure. So I'll highlight this first before talking about the actual event. Um, if your kid's not playing futsal or what I would call just smaller sided games, so 5v5 and smaller, um, you're making a very big mistake. And a lot of times the excuses I hear from parents are, oh, my son doesn't like it or he's not good enough at it. Well, OK, that's why he needs to play it, because he needs to improve. And mm-hmm. if or, or they'll say stuff like, oh, he needs to keep practicing his position for 77 or 9v9 or whatever age group. And you know, you brought it up earlier, nobody's getting a college scholarship or professional contract at 11 years old, um, which I call zone one. So that's the development and preparation zone to get ready for zone two, which is 15 years and older, where you actually have a chance to be seen for something. But um, Mm -hmm. to to your point about the representing the national team. So it was obviously a very unique experience, probably one of the best, if not the best time of my life. I actually felt like Cristiano Ronaldo because we just had so much attention. Like mm-hmm. we would just travel anywhere and people were coming up asking for autographs or asking for your shirt or what, whatever it was. Like it was just completely different uh, feel because it, it's the Futsal World Cup, mm-hmm. which is great. So we played against Nepal. Um, we were in Misiones, Argentina. It's kind of like a state. And we ended up winning that game two to one. We arrived the day of the game, which was crazy because long story short, we didn't qualify. We lost to Canada in the qualifiers and they were were a very good team. We ended up losing like in the last 30 seconds, we were tied 2-2. They scored to make it 3-2. So they knocked us out and they won and and went on to the the World Cup. But they backed out apparently last second, like 72 hours left. So the Federation's calling all the players, which I was one of them and said, hey, look, you know, we're probably going to go. And we're like, okay. Then I got a call probably 65 hours before, okay, we're not going, Canada's confirmed. And I'm like, ah. Then they call one more time, probably 55 hours before, give or take. Hey, we're in, 100%. We're like, what? So they, we actually had to book our own flights, but they reimbursed us afterwards. So we just, just to make sure we could get on the plane and get down. Because mm-hmm. we're all coming, we're not together, we're not at a training camp, right? So we're all in different locations around the country. So I was in Orlando where people from... Portland and California and Virginia and wherever they're coming from. So we all had to book mm-hmm. flights. We got reimbursed for it. Get down. We all had to, you know, arrive at the right place, whatever, get there. So we arrived. We had to take a four hour bus ride to the hotel um, and then from the hotel, grab our stuff or drop the stuff off and then go to the game on um, first game. So, I mean, I-, I won't even lie. Like I was nervous as hell. Like I remember I wasn't like panicking, you know, but like, you're like, okay, I'm actually here. Like this is the world cup of futsal, which was crazy. 
And I always dreamed as a little kid doing something like that. So to be able to achieve to play in a World Cup, which was cool. And um, fortunately, we had a not an easy opponent, but an easier game. You know, Nepal is not the same as Spain or, or France. So we ended up beating them two to one. Um, then we go to Spain, I think two days later. And um, I mean, that was just a different level. Like that was the first time I've ever been in a game and my head was actually spinning about how fast they played compared to us. Mm-hmm. So that was like, I, we came off at halftime. We were already down five, nothing, maybe I think it was five. I think it finished 10, zero, maybe 11. And uh, you know, with some of the teammates on the side were just saying, ah, you know, the game's over. And I'm like, dude, you're playing for the national team. Like, just give everything you have. Like, just finish the game. Like, you know, you mm-hmm. got to play to represent the badge, right? You're playing for your country. And um, so we went out, ended up losing the game. And, and literally, like, I remember being in the court and I'm going like this. And my head is just spinning in circles because they played so much faster than what I could play at. And I was like, wow, this is what the next level looks like. Then the third game is a, you know, top two go through, right? So we're, we beat Nepal. We lost to, to them, uh, Spain. Now we're playing against France. And this is winner goes through. We would finish second in the group if we won because Spain would have finished top. So it's, it comes down to this last game. We ended up losing four to three. Two of the goals were our own mistakes. Luckily, it wasn't from me, but like one of them was a, a free kick routine. Um, the two guys that were in charge of it completely messed up and they ended up scoring on the counterattack. So we lost four to three. If we would have won that game and gone through, we would have played Argentina, which was the host. Mm-hmm. Argentina, ended up winning a, Argentina ended up winning the entire tournament. So I couldn't even imagine how brutal that game would have been being, being in Argentina right? Um, in the host country. And like, we were actually at the final between, it was actually crazy. It was, it was um, Argentina versus Brazil. So the, the seating for the arena was like 3000 people. They crammed about 7,000 people into the event. Oh, wow. And there was maybe three Brazil jerseys from fans. So like that was <laughs> the first time because Brazil was about to win. There was 12 seconds left and they got a, a sideline play. They put the ball into the box, Argentina. They get a shot blocked. They get it back into the box, penalty. Boom. And um, it, it, they missed the penalty, and then they get the rebound, and boom, they score. And they, they score with, like, four seconds left. It was the craziest, like, last 12 seconds I've ever seen in any sporting event history. It was nuts. And during that game, like, I actually felt like if, if Brazil would have won – because there was no security check. There was no, like, let's check bags. Like, mm-hmm. I was genuinely scared for my life because I'm like, dude, if Brazil wins this, there <laughs> people will die today. Like, that's how that's how scared I was in terms right. of, like, it, it was crazy because it, just the emotion of having almost 7,000 Argentinians crammed into one thing, watching their country lose the final was nuts. So that was the first time in my life, like, I genuinely felt scared. Like, I was like, we, somebody's going to die today if this happens. You know, it, long story short, Argentina won. But, like, he, and this is why I always, you know, talk to people and tell parents and kids, I'm like, look, if you really have a goal, like you need to shoot for it. You know, I don't want to say don't have a backup plan, but the guys that make it somewhere don't have a backup plan. Like it's, it's all or nothing. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, we're fortunate to live in a country where you can have options and go to school later and do stuff. So I always tell people like, if you have that dream, you can always go to school later, but like you cannot take away that experience that I had of representing the United States out of futsal world cup. Of course it wasn't football, which I preferred to do. At the time, at least, but you know, to walk away doing something that you know, point zero one percent of people will ever do in their lives mm-hmm. was probably the best time of my life, to be honest. So um, that's why I always tell people like, think bigger picture, don't think smaller stuff. Like, you know, to, to kind of summarize it for you, like probably a month ago, my dad asked me, he's like, hey, I have a tournament, a, a trophy from a tournament you won when you were U10. Do you want it? And I'm like, dad, like, I love you to death, bro. But that thing means more to you than it does to me. You keep the trophy. Like, I, I don't need a trophy from when I was 10 years old. Like, that doesn't mean anything to me. But the experience mm-hmm. I have of representing the United States, training Luis Nani, who's one of my you know, childhood heroes growing up, like, you can't, you can't replace that kind of stuff. So, but the only mm-hmm. reason why I got to that point was because of how I was prepared and developed in my youth career to get to this point today and all the things that I went through, the trials and tribulations and whatnot. So it, it's just game changing when you do stuff like that. And you either, and this is why I always tell people, like, you got to play up because you'll see how bad somebody really wants it. When you play up and it's outside of the comfort zone, you'll see, like, are they really ready to go and take this next step or are they going to crack under the pressure? And if they crack, it's time for them to move on and go to school. And that's okay. Like, school is always there for people. But, mm-hmm. you know, you got to test the fires and see how the player responds to those type of details. So that's why I always make that recommendation. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's um, something that my state organization has issues with 
um, letting teams play up because there's teams that really need to play up because they're killing everybody in their age group. And then there's teams that just want to play up because this other team is playing up and we should get to do it as well. And so there's been some issues with that in the last, I don't know, 10 years or so. And the only thing that it hurts is the players. It doesn't hurt your organization. It doesn't hurt Mm -hmm. the other teams that don't deserve to be there. Cause I remember one of our teams, one of the very first teams that I was watching that my husband was coaching, they had been playing up and then this rule went into effect and they had to go down and play in their own age group and they killed everybody. So it wasn't a good thing for their team. It wasn't a good team for the good thing for the teams that they were playing. People were getting angry, and the only thing that we could tell them was complain to the state because they're the ones that made us do this. Like, this is not our fault. This is not where we want to be. We don't want to be in this division. We want to be where we should have been. And when they finally were able to go back up because they had been playing down for six, seven months, however long it was that they made them play down, by the time that they went back, it was like... A totally different thing because their trajectory had been on par and then when they had to take a step down it was like they lost that momentum and it really sucked like I really wish that they didn't have to go through what they had to go through and so it it's been really difficult with with that um, we have a couple another team that currently plays up and um, they do really well um, they are a group of extremely talented kids I mean, they're exceptional, and I love watching them. Their love for the game is amazing. Um, Their understanding of the game is great, Um, and I love watching them and seeing where their little minds go. Um, My son is on that team as well, but um, he's the goalkeeper, which is nerve-wracking to be a keeper mom. So, again, all the keeper moms out there, I feel you. I I totally feel you. I'm a nervous wreck every time he's in there. My daughters occasionally play, which again is nerve wracking. So, um, keeper moms, I feel you because <laughs> it's not it's not the favorite thing in the whole entire right, world right, right. to be the to be the keeper parent. Um, but somebody's got to do the job, and he loves it. It's so. hard, yeah, definitely a hard life. Yeah. So, um, but it, I mean, they are. One thing. I think you said at the beginning, they, the kids have to fall in love with the game. Yeah, yeah, and and that's one of the things that I love about watching these kids is is their love for it and their passion for it. And, you know, they're the types of kids that always have a ball at their feet. Like whenever, you know, I see them outside the game, they, you know, they go to other people's games. They go watch the local Real Real Salt Lake games. They go, you know, they just love soccer. And so they watch soccer. They talk about soccer. They live and breathe soccer. And so it's really great to see their love for it and, and how they love the game and, and, and that's what what we as coaches and parents want is for the people that play soccer is we want them to love it. And that's I love that group. Um, they're a great little group. Um, but anyway, is there anything else that you want to touch on? We I mean, we could go on for hours and hours about different things. But as far as what we've covered today, you know, just like the fundamentals and and the development of where we want players to go. Is there anything else you specifically want to talk about? I mean, the last thing I would say would just kind of tie into, you know, the age group formats um, of 77 and 99. I, you know, I'm just not a fan of those age groups. I think in theory, having 77 and 99 is good if we had a country that was bought into playing football. But since most places aren't teaching kids how to actually play and they're teaching them to kick into a soccer ball versus playing the game of football, um, and that it's not the number one sport. You know, we're probably sport number four, maybe three mm-hmm. on the list of, you know, priority. So and one of the things that we're doing with our program of Beast is trying to change the, the format. So we actually hosted our first 2v2 tournament because, again, using the average American kid, they understand from the ages of six to nine years old, they understand themselves a teammate, a defender, and a ball. So if you start adding way more than that, they're not going to understand the premise of the game. And then what, what I've noticed with 77 is, especially when kids that just don't have the level and whatnot, coaches pigeonhole them into a position. So they're going to say, okay, little Johnny, the seven-year-old, you're going to play defender only. Okay, Christian, you're going to play goalkeeper only. Okay, Jackson, you're going to play striker only. 
and they don't ever change positions. And that's just to the long-term de- detriment to the kids. They're not going to learn how to do all four phases of the game, which is, you know, you do as well as me, attacking, defending, transition to attack, transition to defense. And what usually happens is they do two out of the four. So if they're a defender, they're going to be defending and transitioning to defense. Mm-hmm. Because on offense, they're playing kickball and they're booting the ball down the field. So they're not learning the key elements of the game because they're being pigeonholed into a position based on the age group formats. So I would commend U.S. soccer to quickly reevaluate, but the the challenge that I've noticed, and I've talked to a couple of people that have been members of U.S. soccer, and they say that, you know, they're not going out and looking at the climate. They're not looking at the age groups. They only see the top level, which would be MLS next, and um, or whatever top level there is for the boys and girls side. They're not looking at what the average is doing. Mm -hmm. So... One of the things that we're trying to do in Orlando is starting with this is creating tournaments and leagues. So one of our next projects is a league um, that will be small-sided, 2v2s, 3v3s. And that's just to give players the long-term benefit of getting more touches on the ball, to have more fun, which is what you already highlighted already, because kids at this age need to have fun. Mm -hmm. Um, And if they're not having fun, then they're going to quit playing football. So a great example would be we had a game with our 2014s who ended up winning the game, I think, 4-3. to Every time this team scores, it doesn't matter, whatever, we let them go celebrate. So they all run to the corner flag like the pros do, and they have their own celebration that they do as a team. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter who scores, they all do the same celebration, and they do it every single time. So the opponent finally scores a goal to make it 4-1. to After watching our team score four times and run to the corner flag to, you know, do their celebration, because that's what the pros do, Mm -hmm. one of their players started running that way with another one, and then all the parents are screaming from the sideline, no, don't do that. Go back. And I'm looking at them like, dude, you're telling seven-year-olds or eight-year-olds or whatever it is, they can't go celebrate scoring a goal? Mm-hmm. Is this about you or is this about them? Right. So it always comes back to who is this about? You're, right. you're Like the, the thing that I tell parents is, look, you're not paying for the results. You're paying for the process. Or at mm-hmm. least that's what you should be doing. So like if I don't have kids, but if I had a kid and he's like, dad, I want to play soccer. Great. I'm paying to see you learn, grow, and have fun. And be mm-hmm. challenged and lose. And when I say lose, I mean like struggle. I don't even necessarily mean lose. I mean struggle. Right. Like it's not always going to be easy because you're telling me that you want to play. I need you to go through all that stuff. I don't care about the result of the win or the loss. I right. care about seeing you grow, progress, have fun, be challenged, and struggle. That's what you should be paying for as a parent when it comes to especially games. But most parents look at it from a result-oriented standpoint, and that's, you know, not to the long-term benefit of your kids, one. And then two, I, I've seen this plenty of times, I'm sure, Katie, you, you have as well, where, you know, a kid makes a mistake on the field, and then they immediately do this. And they mm-hmm. look directly at, normally it's dad, it's normally not mom, but it's sometimes it'll be a mom. And what that tells me is they know that something's coming. That's why they looked at you, because you're on top of them the entire time, which means... Basically, you are living through your child versus letting your kid experience and play the game. So my recommendation is do not be that what I call a toxic parent where you're either on the sideline, joysticking, berating, screaming, whatever word you want to use to describe it. Don't do that. Come with, you know, a snack, a drink, bring a lounge chair, put your feet up, relax and just actually thoroughly enjoy watching your child play because that will change your guys's life forever because if you keep acting the same way that you're doing by joysticking berating screaming even when in the car like you will ruin your relationship with your kid and you will actually force them to quit playing Mm -hmm. so and i can actually give you a very quick story with this so with the program that i run in the morning that is called beast there's a kid that joined recently probably three months ago goalkeeper and the dad was always on the field for like two weeks watching his kid and then like constantly like talking to him during training and at water breaks talking to him and i i had to talk to dad for about an hour i'm like look why does your kid play he's like oh because he wants to and i said okay great so if he wants to do this why are you even talking why are you on the sideline berating him or or even talking to him i'm like look i get it it's extremely frustrating when your kid makes a mistake i feel the same way i said but the difference is i understand that your child has to make the mistake to learn and grow because he's not a generational talent, which means he's not somebody that's going to be a professional player at 15 years old. It's just the case. So I'm like, he has to go through a lot of learning moments and you're taking that away from him. And you're also making it to a point where 
Like he, same thing. He, every time, even in training, this kid was looking at his dad like this, just because every time he made a mistake, he knew his dad was going to rip into him. Mm-hmm. And I, I told the dad after about an hour, I'm like, look, you got to stop. If you don't stop, I'm going to take him out because you are, you're causing a detrimental long-term impact to your child. You don't recognize it now, but you'll kid, your kid will quit. And he's actually stopped now. And he just sits in the car and just lets his kid play. I don't know what happens when they get back into the car, but at least I know when he's at training and he's at games, dad's quiet not speaking and and I can see that the relationship has improved because dad is actually doing his role he's there to be a supporter not a coach so last piece yeah. of, last piece of advice as a parent once you find a coach that cares about doing the right thing for your kids whether it's Katie whether it's me whether it, whoever it is be a parent do your role support do not coach your kids and let them figure this stuff out if if you want them to be independent and grow up to be successful people if you want if you want them coming to you for the rest of their life and you want to hold their hand all the way through 20, 30 years old, then mm-hmm. continue to solve all their problems throughout their youth career. And mm-hmm. that, that'll be the last thing that I say about it. Yeah, it's it's definitely been an interesting thing because that's something that, um, like, I always hold, I don't, I want to say closed training sessions. Parents are not allowed to come and sit on the sidelines. Um, they can go sit in their cars, but they're not allowed to be, um, visually like their kid can't find them and look at them. Like you say, like if they make a miss, like practices and games at this age are for making mistakes. It's for trying something that they want to try and seeing how they can, you know, the only way that they're going to get better at a skill is by trying it and trying it and trying it. And they're not going to get it right on the first time. They might not get it right on the 10th time. Like they have to practice it. And so, um, for me to, to Yeah. And so they, the parents have to give them that room and I will give them encouragement. I'm never going to say you, you know, that was awful. That was horrible. That was terrible. Like I'm going to encourage my players to try things. Um, and for parents to sit on the sidelines, like obviously they're going to come to games, but like at practices, it's not giving their kid the freedom to learn. You know, it's it's like putting them in a classroom. You're not going to sit with them at their desk and do their schoolwork for them. Um, it's something that they have to learn on their own. And so you have to give them that space and that freedom to be able to do that. And, you know, it's a way for them to bond with their teammates. You know, it makes them a better player, like you said, a better person, human being, um, just in general. So it, it's something that I've had to um, just recently because we started training indoors because it's winter here and... Um, I had parents that have started to just stay and being indoors has been even worse because like, I'll be, you know, Mm -hmm. setting something up, talking to the girls before we start doing another exercise and the parents are over there talking and it's in a building that echoes and I can hear them and I'm like, be quiet. And it's like the parents think that I'm only talking to the players and I'm sorry, parents, I was talking to you too. Like you need to shut your mouth. But anyway, I had to send a, I had to send an email to, to my parents reminding them that the rule is that parents are not allowed to be there. And so, you know, it's been better. Like the parents, you know, they drop their kid off and they leave, but the girls have more fun when their parents aren't there. Like parents were literally handing water bottles to players during water breaks and water breaks are for the girls to be able to, or the players, you know, to be able to bond with each other, joke around a little bit, like become friends, better teammates. I mean, you know, not everybody has to be your best friend, but you know, they need to get used to the people that they're playing with. And it's good for them as a human being just to be able to do that. And they need that freedom from their parents. So I totally agree with that. Um, I've shared on this podcast before of some parents that have done some crazy things during my training sessions um, that, you know, walking out on the field in the middle of a session and yelling at their kid. And I was just like, what on earth is happening here? So Anyway, um, but I totally agree with that. It's great advice. So for all of you parents that are listening, even the players, you know, make sure you're giving the players that that space to be able to be the player and enjoy the game and love the game, you know, like especially during games as well. They don't need their coach and their mom and -and so-and-so's dad and -and so-and-so's mom or dad, all these people yelling at them, trying to coach them like the coach is the person that should be, you know, coaching because that's coaching. their title. <laughs> your title is parent in this in this thing. So know your role definitely, um, because it gets it gets so confusing. 
so confusing when there's too many voices. Too many cooks in the kitchen doesn't help anybody. So, um, but I have well, really I mean, the, enjoyed. The thing at the end of the day that I've noticed is when you when you take kids and you have a parent and a coach coaching, they're going to listen to the parent because that's the person they're going home with. Mm-hmm. Yep. Which, you know, if mom and dad are telling them to kick it, the kid's going to kick it. If the coach is telling them to dribble, they're going to dribble. Mm-hmm. Or, I'm sorry, they're not going to dribble. They're going to kick it because parents telling them to kick it. So it, it, that's why you pay a coach to coach. You don't pay the coach to coach and you coach. If you want to coach, yeah. go get a license and go coach. Yeah. It's not I mean, that hard it, to go to the U.S. Soccer website, take the online coaching course and do it. That's what I did. I mean, I, you know, my husband basically was like, you can't be doing what you're doing because my daughter's coach wasn't coaching at the time. And I was getting super frustrated and coaching from the sideline. And he happened to be there and he got mad at me for doing exactly what I'm telling everybody not to do. And I stopped and then I got my license. I went and got out. I got my license. I got qualified and now I'm her coach. And, and so, I mean, it's not, it's a really hard role to fill. I've definitely, the past few years that I've been doing it, it is very difficult. There's a lot of a lot of things that go into planning training sessions, planning how we're going to play a game. And the other thing that parents probably don't realize when a coach has a team playing in a game, there might be something specific that they're supposed to be working on. And by you yelling at your player to do something could be completely contradictory to the skill or whatever it is that the coach wants to execute in that game. Like I know that there are certain things that um, like my husband for the older ages, if they know that they're going to a certain tournament and they've scouted a team and they know they play a specific way, they will practice playing a certain formation or something and so they're ex- the players you know they have talks about it they have a plan of action that they're going to go and do and so they will practice in games something that they're building up towards and parents don't always know that because the coach is communicating to the players what's going on but mm-hmm obviously not the parents because they're not the ones that are going to be out on the field. And so the players are the ones that need to execute whatever it is that they need to with their team. And so by parents yelling at them, it could throw off the whole entire thing that's trying to go on during the game, you know, and I, I actually had um, a player one time that I think we, I think we were working on something and they got mad at their, this is totally something I would have done or probably did do as a player, but got mad at their mom for yelling at them during a game or something, you know, because they were trying to work on something. And, and so, you know, parents just don't frustrate your kids by getting, getting in their heads because they obviously want to do right by their parents and they want to listen to their parents. But in that moment, they need to be listening to their coach. And so what you, the best thing for you to do is to cheer them on and be their biggest cheerleader and support them during their game because that's what they're going to remember they're not, they don't want to be the person that like i remember my mom jumping up and down it's a funny memory but she was doing it as a cheerleader for me but she was running up and down the field basically yelling at me to like run faster like come on like i remember that my mom was there cheering me on and it was honestly embarrassing and i did get mad at her one time for yelling at me um but it, right. you know you want your you want your kids to remember that their parent was there and cheering them on like i know some people whose parents were horrible parents and they talk about how you know as we're adults and they were like i really hated the way that my mom or dad you know used to do this during my games well guess what you're doing the exact same thing to your kid right now like Mm -hmm. it's a cycle so break the cycle (laughs) break the cycle i'll I'll finish with this i think this will help people understand a little bit and then i gotta run actually i got a meeting i gotta get to in about 10 minutes but yeah um so in orlando you know you never know who's gonna walk through your door and I had, if you ever heard of Roberto Carlos, I had his nephew mm-hmm. for three years. So he, he just ended up leaving the program this past summer, but we had him from nine to 12. And um, we took him from basically not being able to walk with the ball to being a pretty good player for his age group. Long story short, Roberto Carlos, who's, in my opinion, the greatest left back of all time, um, came to a tournament, was actually a futsal tournament, came to the futsal tournament to watch his nephew play. Mm-hmm. And... You know, so he's on our team bench. There he is sitting there right next to us. And I'm looking at him, waiting for him to actually start speaking. And I'm like, if anybody would have the right to speak, it would be this man. Because he's won a World Cup, for example, with Brazil in 2002. Like, 
the level of experience that that guy has as a player, like you cannot compare and he would have the right to speak. But what I tell everybody is people don't realize what he actually did. And uh, what he actually did was he sat there quiet as hell, didn't say a word to anybody except the people that were sitting with him. So mm -hmm. his family and whatnot. He didn't speak to a single player. Didn't say one word the entire game to it, not even to his nephew who's playing. He, he might have spoke to him after the game. I don't know. But during the game, Roberto Carlos, guy that's won a World Cup, is not talking, not berating, not joysticking, not screaming. He's mm -hmm. sitting there smiling, clapping, and waving. That's it. That's all he did for the two matches that he watched his nephew play. And mm -hmm. I'm going... This is a guy that has won a World Cup with Brazil in 2002, probably the best left back of all time. If anybody would have the right to speak, I would have sat down and let him speak and, and coach the game. Mm -hmm. But he's letting me do my job because I was the coach. Mm -hmm. And here this man is with his resume, 3,000 times better than mine, and he's doing nothing but smiling, waving, and clapping. Yet we have parents on the sideline that are screaming, joysticking, berating, whatever fancy word we want to use to describe it these days when they've never had a career outside of high school, they've never played college, they've never played professional, they haven't played any sport at a high level, they don't know what it takes, and yet here you guys are joysticking, berating, and screaming at your kids. Mm -hmm. Don't. Take the advice of Roberto Carlos. Sit there, smile, wave. You mm -hmm. will be happier, and your mm -hmm. child will be happier. Yep. That's all I'm going to leave it with. Yep, yep. I we've had professional coaches and former professional players on the sidelines of our games and they've done that exact same thing. They've stayed silent and they've just cheered. And so I totally agree with you on that and it will definitely make your relationship with you and your player better and it may make your player a better player in the long run because they know that they have that support mm -hmm. from from their family. Um, but Kyle, I've loved talking with you. It's been great. You know, we like I said we could go on for hours. So, um but thank you so much for coming on. I will link in the show notes all of Kyle's contacts and links that you guys can go check out his content and things. If you guys want to go check out his YouTube, his um, Instagram, his podcast that he has. He's got a lot of great information out there. But I've really enjoyed having you on. And thank you for coming on today. Thank you for having me, Kate. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak with you and, and try and get more information out for parents to hopefully make better decisions. That's the whole point at the end of the day. So thank you so much for letting me come on and have a voice to do so. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And I hope we'll have you on again in the future. So it's been great and have a great rest of your day. Thanks for kicking it with me and have a great day. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Kick It With Katie Podcast underscore between all the words. You can reach out to me with questions at Kick It With Katie Pod at gmail.com. I also have a feature with SpeakPipe where you can leave me your own voicemail message if you want to be featured on the podcast. Rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts.